it's time to be open, to unlock, unlimit, and unleash data. It's time to work together. Above all else, it's time to simplify. One place for all your data. One foundation for every workload, from BI to AI. One platform that runs where you run. One architecture that puts an end to the trade-offs and brings it all together. One Lake House. Well, welcome everyone to day two of track number three. Uh, this session, this morning session nine three is a one hour session. We have a very distinguished speaker, Professor Michael Stonebreaker, who is an adjunct professor here at CSAIL and also the winner of the 2014 ACM Turing Award. So Michael's here to talk to us this morning about data mastering in the cloud. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you turn the volume up so I don't have to talk so loud? Okay, so I want to talk about data mastering in the cloud. What am I really going to talk about? Well, first of all, I'll just remind you all what is data mastering. Then I'll tell you why you should be aggressively moving whatever mastering you're doing to the cloud. And then I'm going to tell you how to make intelligent cloud decisions, like what is the best cloud architecture, and why is cloud native such a good idea? And then I have a couple of things at the end on how to deal with real time. And I always get questions about how to include text in mastering decisions. And I will leave time for some questions, I hope. So what is data mastering? Well, enterprises are full of data silos. Uh, why are they? Because uh, if you if your if your CEO tells you okay go go see if you can make a business in selling uh, ice to the Eskimos, uh, and he gives you some money and he gives you a fixed amount of time to make something happen, and you go off and you set up whatever data structures, whatever data you need, uh, you uh, whatever you're doing, whatever you, however you're selling. Uh, you're going to do your own thing. You're not going to spend two years trying to be compatible with everybody else in the enterprise. So you're going to set up your own silo. Uh, and so everyone does that. Because uh, otherwise all decisions have to go through God and it takes forever. So any of you who work for sizable companies are accustomed to there being tens to hundreds of silos that are independently constructed data sets. And the problem is there's huge business value in integrating those silos after the fact. No one's going to do it in advance because uh, your ice business to the Eskimos may fail and then you've wasted a whole bunch of time. So. With a bunch of silos, uh, cross-selling between independent business units is an obviously great thing to try and do. So if you're trying, if you're trying to sell to the Anchorage Electricity Commission and I'm selling ice to them, then you want to know that and uh, utilize my contacts. So cross-selling, dot, 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 dot. Silo integration has huge business value. So what do you need to do to do silo integration? After the fact, meaning these silos exist, what you want to do is put them together uh, semantically and tattoo this on your brain. Independently constructed schemas are never, ever plug compatible. I have never seen plug compatible schemas that were built independently. So you've got a data integration problem, and how, what does that entail? 
First of all, move data sets to a common place. You just heard a big ad for lake houses. I don't care how you do it. Uh, and so you get the data to where you can work on it. Uh, then you need to deal with transformations, uh, get data into a you know, common units and meeting. If you're the HR person in Paris, I'm the HR person in New York, your salaries uh, are in euros uh, after taxes and with a lunch allowance. My salaries are gross in US dollars. You gotta get them into common units, common meaning. You gotta perform scheme integration. You call it salary, I call it wages. Uh, you call it employees, I call it workers. A big, hairy, huge deal is you then try and put the data together and it's going to be dirty. Think in round numbers that 10% of your data is missing or wrong. So you gotta fix it. Uh, one of the favorite things that people who have numeric data do is they don't somehow, somehow they don't like to use nulls they put in minus 99 to mean salary is missing. And the trouble is, if you just do an average of salary, you just average in minus 99, not such a good idea. So you gotta clean your data. As often as not, you don't have enough signal to put it together. So you need to do enrichment, get some more fields, do a join of each data set with something else. One of the favorite ones is Dun & Bradstreet numbers, but there are lots of others. So perform enrichment. And then comes the uh, big enchilada. You've got to perform entity consolidation. Find, find the entities in each data set that mean the same thing and put them together. So find clusters of entities that are the same. And then as often as not, if you have a cluster, uh, I'm Mike Stonebreaker in one database, I'm MR Stonebreaker in another one, uh, and you gotta decide what, my real, what name you really wanna use. Uh, so find golden values for the uh, attributes in clusters. Sometimes you need to do classification. In other words, classify uh, customers as either international or local. And then of course, this is never one and done. Then, then the minute there's an update to any of these data sets, you've got to do something to uh, do ongoing stewardship. So that's what it's all about. And so silo integration really means a pipeline of some number of these uh, actions in some order. And it's called by lots of things. We'll use the term data mastering to mean this stuff. So this is what we're talking about, data mastering. Okay. Uh, if you need to, if I have 10 records and you have 10 records and you want to put them together, do it however you want. Use your wristwatch, put them on pieces of paper, draw lines between the records, do it, do it whatever you want. So this gets very interesting when you have to do it at scale. And so most of you need to do it at scale, which means you've got lots of entities, lots, lots of data sets, and invariably those get updated. So do it at scale. If, you're, if you don't have to do it at scale and you never have to do it at scale, then now would be a good time to leave because, and make some, you know, go, go attend one of the other talks. So anyway, at scale. So just for example, what does scale mean? Uh, this turns out to be a tamer customer. It's Toyota Motor Europe. So they want to master customer data across all of Europe. Why do they want to do that? Well, if I buy a Toyota in Spain, and then I drive across the border into France and take a job in France. I'm now dealing with the French subsidiary, not the Spanish subsidiary. They're completely independent. They're independent silos. And uh, Toyota develops amnesia when I cross a country boundary in Europe. So you wanna put all of these 
local databases together. And they're either country specific or in Germany they're canton specific. So there's lots of distribu distributors, most of them not under the control of Toyota. And you want to, and Toyota wants to put them together to have a better customer experience. Well, what are we talking about? Well, 30 plus million customers in 250 databases, most of them not under Toyota's control. And by the way, they're in 40 languages. So this is what we're talking about. Do it at this kind of scale. So tattoo this on your brain, which is if you get nothing else out of this talk, if you've got to do data mastering at scale, it's got to be a machine learning problem. Nothing else is going to work. So all the traditional elephants are selling you rule engines, and they don't scale. So I'm going to just give you a quick example of why that is. But the only thing that scales is to do this using machine learning. So here's an example of a that, OK. Here's an, ex uh, an example that I'm familiar with. Uh, this is not a Tamer customer. I can't tell you who this is because it's a little embarrassing. Uh, so they've been doing uh, data mastering for 13 years. So they started in 2009. And they drank the Kool-Aid from the traditional vendors and then said, let's just set up a rule engine to tell us how to do entity consolidation. So what do they want to do? Well, they have, they have content. So just, for example, think of Star Wars. And so they license their content uh, to all kinds of people and collect royalties. And the trouble is, is that some people call it uh, Star Wars Episode VI. Some people call it The Empire Strikes Back, et cetera, et cetera. So they got to put together content with no global keys. So that's their problem. And over 13 years, they have written 200,000 rules. 200,000. Uh, they've had two people working on this full time uh, for that entire time. So think of this as a $5 million adventure. And it is completely unmanageable. It's unmaintainable. If, they add, if you have to add a new data source, it takes months. If anything changes, which is I decide to no longer call this uh, episode six, I call it something else, then, uh, then everything falls apart. So this is an example of rule systems don't scale. Now, a standard wisdom that I'd also like you to tattoo on your brain is that if you're dealing with rule technology, you can grok 500 rules. And after that, it gets a little hard. Well, you twist my arm hard, and I'll give you 1,000. Twist it even harder, I'll give you 2,000. But the trouble is, rule gestures are independent utterances. And you get enough of them, and no one can figure out what the heck's going on. And that just well, well, well understood by people who've tried to do this and failed. So why does it take 200,000 rules? You might ask. And this particular company isn't. The people who are doing this are not dumb. So it, it's not because they're stupid. The problem is uh, that you've got, it just it gets complicated. And so this is uh, an example of somebody called B&G Foods Incorporated. I, I have no idea who they are. This just turns out to be an example from the Tamer UI that has a bunch of clusters. So this is the cluster for B&G Foods. So it gives them their name, their address. And you can see, uh, uh, sorry, I wish this was brighter. But you can see that B&G Foods is called by various names. And it has 
some some their address some you know is varies their city varies their state varies so just imagine you you have a rule engine and you're putting these four records together well it'll take you it'll take you a few rules and so you write a rule that says well if you see ampersand that's the same thing as and and so that would be one rule you can keep going so you write a bunch of rules. Trouble is the next one is uh, just another random example. This is Deutsche Bank Capital Funding Trust 8. So just another random entity. And there's five records that uh, are consolidated into this cluster. And you can see that again, names don't match, addresses don't match, uh, et cetera. But you need a different set of rules to resolve this one than the previous one. So the problem is you just need lots and lots of rules because it's a fairly complicated domain. So they, this company wrote thousands and thousands of rules. And so the technology just does not scale. So the only thing that does scale is machine learning. Why is that? Well. Machine learning says, take, get some training data, and I'll tell you in a minute how to do that. And then feed that training data uh, into a system that will build a model that will then do uh, entity consolidation for everything. So all it takes is you have to get some training data, and, and machine learning does the rest. Now, how do you get training data? Well, if you have to use a rule system to get training data, that's okay. If you have some lying around, that's perfect. Uh, one of the biggest problems with, with doing machine learning is getting enough training data to train the model. I have to agree that becomes the high pole in the tent. Okay, so that's what data mastering is all about. It's a machine learning problem at scale. Now, why would you be interested in moving it to the cloud? Well, it is very computationally intensive. Anything that has ML in the, in the title is computationally intensive. So it entails a batch ML mastering project at time zero, which is a lot of compute, a lot. And then every time something changes, you've got to do some sort of incremental uh, project, project for changes, and that's a lot less computing. So the compute you need varies over time. And so it varies a lot over time. So then why, why would that be interesting on the cloud? Well, first of all, essentially, I, I am firmly committed that you guys will move everything you possibly can to the cloud over time. It may take you a decade, it may take you two decades, but you are gonna move essentially everything to the cloud. You wanna get rid of your on-prem data center. Why do you wanna do that? Well, you're gonna do that to save money. How's that gonna save money? Well, let me just give you a couple of quick vignettes. Uh, Dave DeWitt, who is a, on the faculty here, has another adjunct. Uh, until recently, he was the head of the Microsoft uh, Jim Gray Systems Lab in Madison, Wisconsin. As of two years ago-ish, here's what Microsoft Azure data centers looked like. So if you're using Azure, you're using, probably using what I'm about to tell you. They are shipping containers. There is power in, there's internet in, there's chilled water in, otherwise sealed. If a board inside that shipping container goes bad, they just configure it out. When enough boards are, are bad, in comes a forklift, you take the shipping container away and drop in a new one. 
Uh, walls and, and roof optional, only there if you need security. You put these in parking lots in places with cheap power. Now imagine your on-prem data center. There's one in building 32 on raised flooring in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You cannot possibly compete price-wise with the cloud guys. It's just not possible. Uh, James Hamilton, who works for Amazon, very, very smart guy, claims that Amazon can stand up a server for 25% of your cost. So just think the eco economies of scale are just dramatic. So it, you're going to get lower cost, but then the big thing is you get elasticity. So if you need a thousand servers to do your batch mastering at the beginning, just ask for a thousand. If you need 10 thereafter, ask for 10. You don't have to provision an on-prem data center with a thousand servers. Uh, that scaling, all that scaling stuff gets handled by the cloud. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna move to the cloud to save money. Now, you are going to get a lot of blowback. Why is that? Because that's because your in-house IT people are not going to like this. Now, it turns out there's a data center in Building 32. Uh, CSAIL has you know a, a cast of characters who keep it up. They claim that they are cheaper than the cloud, and that's technically correct because they don't pay for power because of externalities about the way MIT operates. They don't pay for floor space, again, because of the way MIT operates. So they're only paying some of the cost. And so, yeah, they're cheaper if you're not counting accurately. And so to the extent that you're uh, enterprise doesn't count accurately, uh, you, you, you may artificially look cheaper, but in real dollars, you are more expensive. Okay, you're going to move to the cloud. The stuff that's easy to move, you want to move first. Decision support stuff, because that's usually easy to move. Uh, and some stuff will get very hard to move. If you have if you have some legacy COBOL that you've lost the source code for, uh, chances are that's just put it in a big box and don't touch it on-prem because the successor in your job will get to worry about it. Okay, in my opinion, data mastering is an absolutely ideal cloud application. It has highly variable resource needs. It's da very data intensive. If you want to provision it on-prem, uh, that's going to be expensive. And if you're moving decision support stuff to the cloud, you may well have already moved the data over there. So just have the computation follow the data. So in my opinion, data mastering on the cloud is a no-brainer. You should be doing that aggressively. So then the question is, how do you want to do it on the cloud? Well, there are three possible ways you could do this. Uh, if you have an on-prem solution, you can do what I call lift and shift. It's running on your on-prem data center somehow. <clears throat> Pick up that thing, move it over, and drop it on the cloud doing as little work as possible. So you're basically regenerating the on-prem architecture that you have right now somewhere else. And the problem with doing that is that whatever the sins of your predecessors are, you are going to preserve them. So. Uh, basically, system management is going to get no easier if you just do a lift and shift. And you're not going to get any elasticity because you are 
presumably hardwired to a thousand servers, you're going to move it onto a thousand servers on the cloud. So you don't get to drop that to, a, to 10 uh, during uh, idle time. So I'm not a big fan of this architecture at all, and I'll have more to say in a minute. So well, what can you do that's better? Well, what's better, uh, at least somewhat better, is uh, do what's called platform as a service. What does that mean? So somebody else, not you, uh, is running cloud instances, uh, and they set up a cloud instance on your behalf, and they run it, and you don't. And that means that your system administrator doesn't have to worry about moving volumes around or any of that stuff. So that will save system management resources because worrying about that now falls on somebody else and not you. But you don't get any elasticity this way. You ask, you ask somebody else to set up a thousand node cluster for you and they run it. And you don't have to, but it's still a thousand node cluster. Okay, better, better than lift and shift, but still not very good. What you should be doing is software as a service architecture. And what does that mean? That means somebody else, whoever it is, uh, basically runs a substantial collection of cloud instances. Uh, you just say, and they're going to do multi-tenancy so that they can, they can mix heavy users and lightweight users on thousand node clusters. Uh, and so that if you're a heavy user, then they'll pair you with some light users. When you stop being a heavy user and you become a light user, they'll get somebody else, put him on, on your cloud uh, instance, and he, he or she will be the, the heavy user. So use multi-tenancy to allocate resources across big instances uh, so that clients can share them and therefore uh, whoever it is that's running this agrees to charge you only for resources that you use and that person worries about the bin packing problem of putting heavy users and light users together. And so uh, this, this enterprise that's running this for you agrees to charge you only for resources you're using and agrees when you ask for more resources to give them to you by shuffling stuff around if necessary. <clears throat> that gets you elasticity because you pay for only the resources you're using, but this requires a lot of effort on the vendor that is supporting this architecture. He's got to have a multi-tenancy solution. He's got to solve a bin packing problem, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the best for you, more work for the vendor. So as you can imagine, vendors are largely trying to sell you platform as a service because that's a lot less work. Don't go for it. Insist on software as a service. Uh, insist on dealing with a vendor that will give you software as a service. Okay, my general opinion, please, please, please do not do lift and shift. You have a once in a generation opportunity. You're gonna take everything your enterprise has and over some amount of time, you're gonna move it to the cloud. Please use this opportunity, this once in a generation opportunity to re-architect stuff. So get rid of the sins of your predecessor. So please take the opportunity to restructure your code, redo it, solve your data mastering problems or some set of them as you move stuff uh, and get 
get lower maintenance, cleaner, uh, cleaner code. The, your successor will really appreciate this. And so whoever gets the job after you, if you leave them a cleaner environment, they'll love you. Of course, management will, management will ask you not to do this because it's more work now, uh, which they never want to do. But take the opportunity to push back. Do not do lift and shift. Because if you blow this once in a generation opportunity, then your successors are going to be stuck with the same mess you're stuck with. So please do not do lift and shift. Platform, platform as a service is widely supported. Most every data manager on the planet will be happy to give you platform as a service, uh, but doesn't get you elasticity. And in my opinion, you should insist on software as a service far and away the best option from your point of view uh, gets you elasticity and best of all means you don't have any, uh, you don't, your main, your system administration costs are minimized. Okie dokie. Now, if you move to the cloud and you're dealing with a vendor, uh, in the data mastering space, every vendor uh, is underneath the, uh, the hood. There's one or more DBMSs, think big table, think Aurora, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's one or more computing platforms, for example, Spark. Uh, one or more text engines, think Elasticsearch, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever mastering solution you have, whether it's homebrew or from a vendor, chances are it's got a bunch of components under the hood. So the question becomes, from your point of view, there are two options. First option is to go with a vendor that will do what's called cloud native, which is to say, look at AWS and pick the best solution for each of these components on AWS. Uh, the vendor will almost certainly also run on GCP. Pick whatever the best set of components is on GCP. Ditto for Azure. So use, use best of breed on each cloud that you happen to run on. Uh, that's, of course, a lot more work than cloud agnostic, which is to pick one solution and use that on every cloud. Uh, so if you do something that's cloud agnostic, then you were forced not to run Bigtable because it doesn't run on AWS, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a more limited set of options that are almost guaranteed to be suboptimal. So if you use a vendor that supports cloud native stuff, it's almost guaranteed to be cheaper, better supported, and more functional. Almost guaranteed. But of course, it's more work for the vendor. Better for you, more work for the vendor, which of course, that's good for you. Okay, so obviously, uh, obviously you want to run uh, cloud native if you possibly can. Use it, choose a vendor that supports cloud native. Okay, what about one and done? Uh, which is you have a mastering problem with, I can almost guarantee you that this is not a, uh, here are two data sets, put them together. Uh, they're never updated, almost never the case. So it's all, one and done is almost never true. So on, on an update to any source data, you've got you've to deal with it because now all of a sudden your master data set is not necessarily correct. 
So you need to run incremental data mastering. So on a change, do something. Now, it's always possible to run your batch time zero system all over again. That will be, that will be a way to dim the lights because uh, that, that's expensive. So please don't deal with a vendor who says we just run, we just run your your batch your batch system <coughs> over again at you know once once a day once a minute once once a month whatever it is. So of course you'd like to deal with a vendor that does incremental mastering, which is is happy to take updates to source data and incrementally diddle the output. Of course, that's a fair amount of work. That requires a different, uh, that requires a different pipeline than the batch model. So it's more work for the vendor, much better for you, because that means that the cost of doing incremental maintenance is linear in the changes whereas the batch system is almost certainly quadratic in the size of the data. So deal with a vendor that, that uh, will support incremental mastering uh, and incremental mastering should be linear in the number of changes. If it's not, run the other way. Now, I. Data mastering is not easy. The reason it's not easy is that you, you, do, you do mastering at time zero. That gives you a model, gives you some output. And then you do incremental mastering for a month or two. However, in lots of environments, the data sort of slowly skews one way or another, at which point your model slowly becomes inaccurate. So incremental clustering will eventually become suboptimal. And so what does that mean? It means that every once in a while you've got to run the batch process again, retrain your model. Uh, and the uh, these events, which are going to be extremely expensive, you want to optimize, which is to say you want to watch the quality of your model. And when it gets, uh, when the quality drops below some threshold that you should get to determine, then pay for uh, rerunning the batch model. So you should deal with somebody who's willing to have a monitoring system that monitors data quality and alerts you when it's time to uh, pay for rerunning the model. Okay, so that's incremental mastering. Uh, how do you want to deal with text? Well, most of your mastering projects have some text. Lots of you don't have a ton of text but like the media company, their content uh, is text. You know, or the, you know, whatever key they, lo whatever local keys they are, there are, are text. So product descriptions are text, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you deal with text? Well, the standard wisdom, and I think uh, I'm not saying anything at all revolutionary here. Uh, what you want to do is get a text parser. There are lots of them, lots of public domain ones, to pick out important words. You know, Google pretty much has the state of the art here. Uh, and most anything ML-ish, Google chances are, has an awfully good solution. And What's important to you is very application specific. So Tamer got to deal with a three letter agency who wanted to uh, master field reports. In other words, 
uh, when are two field reports talking about the same thing? Which is, a t think of this as terrorist attack on blah, blah, blah. So of course, uh, the three letter agency is interested in terrorists and jihad and a whole bunch of other things. That chances are, that's not the text about product descriptions. And so what's interesting is very application specific. My brother used to be in the 101st Airborne and he would talk about legs. <clears throat> and a leg in his world is somebody who is only a foot soldier, I mean only, only deals with stuff on the ground as opposed to airborne, airborne soldiers. So there's all kinds of vocabulary that is very application specific. So you need a text parser and then you need to decide what vocabulary is of interest to you. Uh, and, then, and then what you wanna do is feed that into an application specific train model, ML model that will then train uh, and so the text comes in and you pick out stuff that you're interested in. So if you get a bunch of words that turn out to represent a big long thing of text, you've turned text into semi-structured data, which most anyone is happy to deal with. So turn it into structured data and get rid of the free text. Use, use a natural language parser to do that. Okay, so what have I been talking about? Well, here's a summary of my point of view. Uh, data mastering at small scale. You have 10 records, I have 10 records. Use anything. I don't, you know, not, not a difficult problem. Uh, and so data mastering at large scale gets interesting. Has to be done as an ML problem. You cannot do this with rule technology. Uh, if you use rule system technology, you will be in the, in the conundrum that the media company is currently in, which is they're dug in pretty deep with a non-scalable solution that doesn't work very well, isn't maintainable, isn't changeable, and the successor in your job will get to deal with uh, figuring out what to do with that mess. Uh, and so the answer is if you have a rule system that isn't working very well, your only real answer is to bite the bullet and throw it away and move to an ML solution. And that's not going to be much fun, but if you don't do it now, and the question is, well, three years from now, you'll be dug in that much deeper uh, with a non-scalable solution that's not working very well. Okay, has to be done using ML. And by the way, I'm happy to admit that ML is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's, it's, you've, got to, you've got to find the training data that's often difficult. Uh, you've got to use active learning, which is run the model, look at the output. If the output is wrong, then you've got to fix the output, feed it back in uh, as more training data. Uh, models are often fundamentally biased. Uh, there's been all kinds of research uh, demonstrating that. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you, if you are deciding whether to give a customer a loan, you're, in the, you're, you're a bank, uh, it's really important for you to figure out how to not make biased decisions, biased against either race, age, whatever. Uh, and that's challenging, very challenging. And in fact, chances are your model will be biased even if you're trying hard to make it unbiased. So 
Also, it, there will be drift and you have to rerun it every once in a while. So I'm not claiming it's easy. I'm just claiming there's no other game in town. So you might as well get facile with machine learning. Uh, and I think that will be true in other domains other than data mastering. Anything you can do using ML, chances are that's probably the best solution. Okay, and please, 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 by the way, don't use a domain-specific product. In other words, if you right now have a customer mastering problem, and you say, well, all I have to do is solve my customer mastering problem, uh, and you pick a solution that is only, only good at customer mastering, well, then the problem becomes, what are you going to do when you have to do product mastering, supplier mastering, uh, customer, uh, you know, in the case of the media company, content mastering. So chances are you will have other mastering problems other than whatever the first one is you're going to take on. So please don't, do, don't use a domain specific problem. And there are a bunch of them out there. I won't name names. You should move your mastering to the cloud. It's an ideal cloud application. You should move everything to the cloud that you possibly can, uh, starting with the easy, starting with the ideal stuff and the easy stuff. But eventually, you want to move everything you possibly can. Your goal is to get rid of your on-prem data center. Why do you want to do that? Because it's guaranteed to be way more expensive than, than the cloud, and you don't get elasticity. So if you move to, to the cloud, you want to use a cloud product that is cloud native. It will run better than ones that are not cloud native. And for goodness sakes, <coughs> Use software as a service as your model. That will be the best for you. It's considerably more work for the vendor. So that's what you should aim for. And of course, mastering, as I've said a couple times, is tricky. I'm not claiming it's not. It's rarely one and done. Have to deal with drift, have to deal with text. Uh, Training data is always the high pole in the tent, almost always, because there's never, there's never enough of it. You don't have it lying around. And the biggest problem with training data, the places where ML has been exceedingly effective is where you can get, uh, you can get mechanical Turk people in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to, you can get unskilled people to, to get training data. Uh, so if you can get training data on the cheap, uh, God bless you. The trouble is, in my experience, most of the enterprise mastering problems, you can't get training data from unsophisticated people. So just for example, if you are mastering customers, uh, well, one possible record is the, a company called Merck with an address in New York. Another possible record is a company called Merck with exactly the same name with an address in Germany. So are they the same company or are they a different company? Uh, any, t any tech stuff you use, chances are we'll say they're the same company, but they're not. They're to two totally different companies uh, that have no relationship to each other. And only somebody you know, in your finance department is going to know that that's true. So the trouble is, is that lots of times training data has to come from knowledge workers and knowledge workers never report to you. They report to somebody else. And getting them to help out with training data is often a challenge. So 
Training data is always in short supply and costly to obtain. And so in my opinion, you should put your best people on mastering projects. And if you don't have any good people, then go hire, go hire some experts. And by the way, hiring experts in this space uh, is going to be very costly and your HR department is not gonna like it. So you've got to pay up uh, and so get, get, get at least a couple people who are knowledgeable in this world to keep you out of trouble. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Uh, I've left 10 minutes for uh, you to get mad at me. Uh, and I say this, this is a Tamer sponsored talk. Tamer's out there in the, in the lobby, go talk to them. Uh, and Tamer, by, as, as you can imagine, Tamer is cloud native dot, 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 dot. So anyway, that's it. I'm happy to take questions. So uh, we did have one question online, but I think you've already answered it. It's the difference between data mastering and master data and MDM. I think you addressed that. It's not, it's just terminology. So with that, I'll uh, open it up for questions uh, here in the audience. Hi, thank you very much for that. So my question is, right, so when we're trying to implement machine learning, right, we're essentially taking what are probabilistic models, um, and when we're applying it to uh, entity resolution or transaction capture, particularly from the financial services space, right, these are uh, discrete pieces of information, right? And whether I'm taking my Dunn's feed or my uh, Bloomberg feed, right, I, I can buy any number of feeds, a number of things happen, right? I can have, particularly in hierarchies, right? I, I can have multiple valid hierarchies for a single entity, right? For stock prices, I can have very different stock prices, end of day closing for an entity, all are correct for a variety of reasons and methodologies. So when you're applying these probabilistic models to discrete information, you may solve 75% of your underlying problem. And obviously there's a cost savings there, but you don't lose the costs and the resourcing for the remaining 25%, right? I mean, how do you address that um, in the models and how do you account for that if you don't mind my asking? Uh, the, the answer is you, your ML system will make mistakes. So, so will your rule system. Uh, and and if, you're, if you're in a world where the best you can do is 75%, uh, that's too bad. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> I think, because that means the other, I guess if, if the, the question is, how, how many errors can your business tolerate? Because if, if, it, if it's zero, if you're in the medical world and, and you make a mistake and it's a, Fifty million dollar lawsuit. That, then you're gonna. It's just gonna. You're gonna have to manually check everything, and and pay up. And so, uh, and so. So I think the the answer is any any ML system, any rule system will make mistakes. Uh, if you can't have, if mistakes are if you can't have mistakes then it's going to get expensive, and I'm sorry. So I wanted to just elaborate on what, what was the previous question. Um, in our world, or maybe when we're talking about that something like child welfare system, the error is now the death of a child, right? So it's very, very significant, which cannot be measured in number of dollars. Although you're reducing the cost by using ML and a product like Tamer, um, or maybe some other products which might be there, I think you're still spending a lot because now your stewardship and the cost of governance has grown. Is that the right statement or? Hey, if, 
the, your cost of governance, you, you want to look at total cost. Yeah, and, and any, any mastering product is comprises of the three pillars, people, process, and technology, right? So here we have talked about technology and reducing the cost of technology, but what I'm trying to say is if it is at equilibrium, we are actually adding to the cost of governance because there might be 25% errors which are really non-negotiable in the business like that. But, but I think I, I, I just push back by saying uh, if you're not if you're not doing mastering, you know, you, you should only do a mastering project if it's going to save you money or, or give, you, give you functionality that you don't currently have. So just for example, uh, G, GE has 75 procurement systems. And as you are, will all be happy to tell me, the ideal number of procurement systems is one. Uh, and so GE figured out that uh, if when you're, if you're, and by the way, the benefit of, so anyway, if, GE figured out that if, when your contract with Staples comes up for renewal, if you can figure out the terms and conditions that were negotiated by your 74 counterparts and demand most favored nation status, that's worth $100 million a year. And by the way, if you screw up and you don't get, and, and some, 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 you can't figure out that Staples matches, Staples in Cambridge matches Staples in New York, uh, then you lose some of that seven, that $100 million. And so there are lots of worlds where there's a lot of upside. And I agree that, that there are worlds where, you know, especially ones where you can't make mistakes, which, which get very challenging. Another question. This is a little bit of a comment to the question. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was the fact that there's rule-based versus machine learning-based. And, you know, in my experience, what I've seen is that standing up a machine learning team to do entity resolution often is extremely expensive to do because you need, like, crazy talent to make it work, work effectively. So hire, hire a vendor. Yeah, right. And then the second piece is, is, is rules-based versus machine learning-based. And in my mind, I actually think a hybrid system is the ideal, right, because... There's machine learning, but there may be some rules that need to override it. And interested in your view, uh, you know, in the landscape of solutions out there, but also in the, you know, you know, do you see fully machine learning based models, or do you see sort of these hybrid where one takes precedence over the other in certain circumstances? I think, I think you know, there's never enough training data, and it's 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 awfully expensive to do it manually. So I think using a rule system to Develop tra to get training data is fine, and then use it, use that to as training data for an ML model. Uh, I think my experience at Tamer is that fixing fixing errors in model output, you've got to use active learning and and correct errors, and that M ML will do a better job at correcting your errors by just having feedback than you trying to figure out rules that will override the ML system. So I, I'm, I'm, I think it will be rule system to build training data followed by ML uh, to do the model and, and that the ML will feed back on itself. Uh, and will, will the ML feed all the way back to developing more rules, maybe. Uh, so I think there will be a place for both technologies. Good morning, Professor. Um, we've talked with you a couple of times uh, coming out of a session here a few years ago. Who's, we're almost ready to start we? mastering. Who's, who's we? Science Applications International. Uh, and um, we, I think the question now is we're almost ready to start. 
So how do we start? We think we have three or four domains that are important. Customers, vendors, employees, uh, products and services. And so we've looked at all of them, and there's value to all of them. Uh, we see connections between them. Uh, a few of us have done this other places, <coughs> have generalized some concepts, but how, how would you start, how would you pick your first subject if you had your, if, if you had your way and you, you were able to tell us what to do? Lowest risk of failure. I'm not sure which one that is. Because <laughs> I think the, the, the mistake I see people making is they want to boil the ocean in a first project. And, and so the, the chances are, so choose something that's really easy, that you really understand how to do, that for which there's an obvious ROI, so that management won't shut you down. Uh, and so, so I think just you know, choose, choose something really easy. You know, uh, GE didn't try and integrate 75 procurement systems you know, at time zero. They tried doing two. And so do something as easy as possible that will demonstrate value. Thank you very much. We're at the end of time. Uh, if you have more questions, I don't know if you'll still be available. Yeah. Stay, I'll stick around. So, uh, thanks everyone for joining today. We'll start our next session in 30 minutes. Thank you again. <laughs>